just giving them a few more minutes for the attendees to, or one more minute for the attendees to sign on here. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kobe Rizik and I am the president of the Buckley Program. Also online, we have our speakers director, Jasper Bors, who is moderating this event alongside me. Welcome to this Zoom lecture titled, The Specter of New Despotism on Similarities Between Communism and Liberal Democracy with Professor Richard Legutko. Before we introduce Professor Legutko formally, we want to say a few words about the Buckley Program. First, for those of you who don't know, the William F. Buckley Jr. Program is an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We do so in a variety of ways, including hosting lectures, dinner seminars, firing line debates, as well as an annual conference. Our over 300 Buckley Fellows have a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on Yale's campus. By providing Yale students with a form to engage meaningfully with serious conservative thought, the Buckley program forwards its mission of a more open and more representative political atmosphere, especially at a university where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge. Buckley fellows believe that all perspectives, including those of the right, must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a fellow on our website, buckleyprogram.com. All Yale undergraduate and graduate students are eligible to be fellows, so if you're a current fellow, um, please share this opportunity with your peers. This lecture is also the third installment of the Buckley Program's new What I Would Have Said lecture series, held in a similar spirit as our annual Disinvitation Dinner. This online series will provide a platform for speakers who have been disinvited or disrupted in some manner. Now on to Professor Legutko. Uh, Rizyard Legutko is a professor of was a professor of philosophy at Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland, specializing in ancient philosophy and political theory. Uh, he has served as the Minister of Education, Secretary of State in the Chancellery of the late President Lech Kaczynski, and Deputy Speaker of the Senate, and is active in the anti-communist movement in Poland. He is currently a member of the European Parliament, Deputy Chairman of the Parliamentary Group of European Conservatives and Reformists and a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Professor Legutko lived and suffered under communism for decades, and he fought with the Polish anti-communist movement to abolish it. Having lived for two decades under a liberal democracy, however, he has discovered that these two political systems have a lot more in common than one might think. They both stem from the same historical roots in early modernity and accept similar presuppositions about history, society, religion, politics, culture, and human nature. In The Demon in Democracy, Legutko explores the shared objectives between these two political systems and explains how liberal democracy has, over time, lurched towards the same goals as communism, albeit without Soviet-style brutality. Professor Legutko was slated to give a lecture at Middlebury College last spring when the school's provost determined that our ability to respond effectively to potential security and safety risks allegedly posed by Legutko's visit meant that the pre previously scheduled lecture had to be canceled. We will allot the first 20 minutes this afternoon for Professor Legutko to give his remarks and then move right into questions from the moderators and the audience. If you wish to ask a question, please submit it in writing using the Q&A feature on Zoom. We will do our best to end the event at 1.30 p.m. Uh, with that, please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Rizyard Legutko to the Buckley Program. Uh, and Professor Legutko, you can begin when you're ready. Thank you, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, uh, yes, I chose uh, the title The Spectre of New Despotism, and it's clear what the new despotism is and what the old despotism was. And the old despotism was, of course, communism, where I spent almost half of my life. And the fall of the communist system was one of the happiest moments of my life. And after the fall, a new political chapter was open, liberal democracy. And uh, we were thrilled to uh, have a new uh, political, 
arrangement, new political institutions. <clears throat> so can uh, liberal democracy be despotic? Can it be a despotism? Uh, 30 years ago, I would have considered a positive answer an absurdity, but slowly this changed. And uh, of course, anyone who's more interested uh, in my argument can read the book. I will just uh, try to uh, give a, uh, a brief uh, <clears throat> description or a brief outline of uh, my, uh, my argument, how I arrived at this uh, conclusion that uh, uh, would have been shocking to me uh, several decades ago. So the first, the first symptom that made me somewhat uh, nervous <coughs> was that the former communists accommodated themselves to liberal democracy, I mean, very quickly, and they were welcome. Whereas the conservatives were not welcome. <coughs> Although the abolition of the communist system was in large part due to the conservative forces, to workers, uh, to the bourgeoisie, uh, rather traditional in its outlook, the Catholic Church. Uh, but they were treated as enemies. Uh, what was remarkable is they were, they were <coughs> these were the same enemies then and now. I mean, those people were enemies, uh, had been enemies under the communist system, and they were enemies in liberal democracy too. And it, so that was the first symptom. The second sy sy symptom which made me worried was language, the change of language. The, uh, the liberal or liberal democratic language is uh, full of friendly concepts like uh, diversity, which was uh, mentioned uh, a while ago, or tolerance. Uh, or pluralism, or openness, or dialogue. But I soon discovered that uh, these friendly, allegedly friendly concepts changed the meaning. Uh, they did not mean what we thought they could mean. I mean, uh, tolerance, the word tolerance became a weapon to beat the opponents. Uh, uh, diversity meant unanimity. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned uh, my uh, uh, adventures uh, at Middlebury, and uh, uh, I can give you a quotation from the, uh, the declaration signed by the, the protesting students, and they said that, uh, let me quote, an organization or academic department that invites a speaker to campus will be required to fill out a due diligence form created by the Office of Institutional Diversity, Equity and Inclusion uh, in coordination with the uh, student organization, Institutional Diversity Committee. Now you see that the word the inclusion here means exclusion. I mean, you have the Office of Institutional Inclusion whose job is to exclude uh, uh, speakers. And that's uh, one of uh, many examples of the change of language. When I joined the European Parliament 10 years ago, or 11 years ago, that was also the first uh, thing I noticed was the language, the, the, the Euro speak. Uh, the, 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 the sentences were either meaningless or they were uh, conveying the same uh, uh, message with monotonous uh, um, intensity uh, and, uh, and the words didn't mean what they used to mean. Uh, another symptom which I found very disquieting in, in the new system was social engineering. I mean, the idea was that uh, the society had to be restructured. You cannot uh, 
uh, leave it as it is. You have to uh, change it. You have to modernize it. Uh, and it also uh, brought to my memory the, the, the social experiments, not only social experiments from uh, the uh, uh, old times. The Soviets wanted to reverse the current of the Siberian, Siberian rivers. Now, in the new uh, system, they started experimenting with basic institutions, such as marriage or a, a family. They wanted to restructure human nature uh, the same way as the Soviets uh, wanted to uh, restructure the human nature. The, the Soviets uh, used to say that they want to create new, new Soviet man. Nowy Sowiecki człowiek, new Soviet man. And, and now it was clear that they wanted to, con to, to create a new liberal democratic man. Uh, and another symptom, which uh, I found uh, also uh, reminiscent of the old times, was uh, politics or politicization. Everything became political. Everything. Uh, not only just in institutions uh, of power, but... Uh, uh, but uh, education... <clears throat> art, uh, religion, uh, family, sex was political, even toilets. I mean, that's an American contribution to politicization. Right? The, the toilets are political, uh, essentially. So, uh, uh, and that was, I think, probably the main, the, the main argument in my, in my book that uh, it is in the essence of both communism and liberal democracy that they aim to politicize the entire society. Just as uh, in, under communists, everything had to be communist. In that liberal demo democracy, everything has, has to be liberal and democratic or liberal democratic, uh, including schools, family, uh, even churches. Uh, and uh, when I ask myself why all this is happening, uh, I think one of the answers is that uh, in the entire Western world and in Europe in particular, uh, you, you can see that uh, the classical political dichotomy between right, uh, left and right no longer exists. Uh, this classical division, right? Political politics was so had been for many years divided into roughly right between the, the political left and the political right. Nowadays it's uh, what is called mainstream politics. Political parties are very similar. The probably it happened after uh, after 1960, there was a tremendous shift to the to the left also of the conservative uh, of the conservative parties now if you look at uh, uh, great britain and uh, france in france it was the the, the socialist party that uh, introduced the uh, same uh, sex marriage law and in the in the united kingdom it was the conservative party so well what's the what's the difference and uh, whoever does not belong to to the mainstream uh, is uh, is politically illegitimate. He must be insane, or he must be fascist. He must be either insane, or he must be or he must be dangerous. You cannot you cannot talk to him, right? You cannot accept him in the country. Uh, as a result of this, we had uh, uh, we had supra national institutions. Of course, for us Europeans, it is the, uh, primarily the, the uh, European Union and, and several European institutions, which represent the, the mainstream politics on the highest political level. And what is characteristic of them, that they are unaccountable to the uh, electorate. They are, they are unelected, they are unaccountable. 
And uh, everything is based on a very vague power structure. Nobody really knows who makes the decision and who is responsible uh, uh, for what. And it's intentional. I mean, you, uh, you make these uh, supra-institutional, uh, su supranational institutions uh, stronger and more intrusive because there is no clear polit uh, political, uh, uh, no, no clear power uh, structure that uh, holds uh, the people uh, accountable. And, and the result of it is, uh, of course, uh, easy to uh, predict. Uh, there is one ideology. There is one ideology that is acceptable. There is one voice, there is one set of, of correct ideas. Uh, and uh, the ideas that, I, that are not, not correct uh, are, uh, are, are not accepted. Uh, and oftentimes they are, they are punished. Uh, the, the, the word correct is, is meaningful. Because it was the uh, it was the communist invention. It, it was a communist uh, word. You uh, opinions, uh, statements, propositions were evaluated according to the correctness, not according to the criterion of uh, truth and falsehood, or right or wrong. Uh, they are correct or they were incorrect. Correct were good, incorrect were harmful. Correct meaning what? Correct meaning uh, in accordance with the, uh, with the one uh, uh, ideology, uh, the, the only ideology that is accepted. And you had, uh, uh, we have a similar phenomenon uh, nowadays uh, uh, in Europe, but not only in Europe. Uh, you can see it uh, in, in the media, you can see it in public space, uh, you can see it in, in mass culture, uh, in, in business. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, you can see that business, which is, uh, I think, also remarkable. Uh, I, I remember uh, a long time ago, we were told that uh, uh, business is only about money, about profit. That the business is not interested in ideology. Business is not ideological. Therefore, capitalism is not e ideological. Uh, it is interested in profit. So whatever sells well is accepted. No, that's, that's not true. That's not true. Uh, uh, to today, and uh, I don't think it was true in the past. Uh, big corporations nowadays are highly ideological, and they uh, finance all those ideological campaigns, and uh, they are very important players in making uh, the, the modern world more and more ideological. So, so even if there are political groups and po political parties in, in Western Europe, uh, they do not have uh, uh, representation in the, in the public space. There, is no, uh, there are no media that uh, represent uh, their uh, opinions. They, they, are, they are vilified. Of course, they have social media, but, uh, but uh, th that's not enough because social media do not enter the, the, the public uh, uh, space. Uh, my country is different. That's why we uh, are so much at, attacked. Uh, in my country, there's a, there's a wide spectrum of opinion from left to, uh, uh, to right and uh, political, yeah, there is political correctness, of course, but it's, it's being res resisted. And, uh, and the final point I want to make is uh, that the result of all this is uh, uh, censorship. We have, 
we have censorship, a well-established institution in, in the European Parliament. I can give you many examples if you want. And we have uh, something nowadays, in, I think in the entire Western world, uh, uh, which uh, George Orwell called thought crimes. And uh, we had thought crimes in the communist system, but I discovered that uh, nowadays in a liberal democracy, there are more thought crimes than we had in communism. We have, uh, uh, I mean, almost every day I read about uh, some thought crime, racism, or fascism, homophobia, sexism, misogyny, logocentrism, transphobia, binaries, and, uh, you know, uh, there, are, there are, as I say, there are more and more uh, of, of them. And, uh, and uh, it's extremely difficult to think and to write because you feel paralyzed. Uh, your, uh, your mind does not work freely uh, each time you may be accused of uh, committing, uh, you know, of sinning against uh, uh, political correctness. So even before you start writing, you censor your own uh, language and, and, and before you censor your own language, you censor your own thoughts. Uh, there, are, there are so many thou shalt not, there are so many things you, you cannot say and you cannot do. Uh, so, uh, I think these are basically the main symptoms of what I call uh, a new uh, uh, despotism. Finally, let me say that uh, in my own country, there are still uh, quite a lot of areas of uh, freedom, but uh, uh, but I'm afraid that uh, uh, well, the future does not look uh, good, does not look uh, 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 radiant, uh, but uh, we shouldn't uh, surrender for sure. Thank you so much, Professor Lugutko. We have um, many questions coming in from the audience, but Jasper and I will start us off with a few of our own. Um, my first question is um, kind of going off of your remarks, does, or do you think that liberal democracy inherently contains the seeds of all of these problems of over politicization, social engineering, as you call it, the new despotism? or is it a perversion of the liberal system in some way? Well, it's a, it's a difficult uh, question, extremely difficult, because we, if you have, if you have a, a, a political philosophy or political theor theory, it may have very many uh, implementations, very many variants of, of uh, 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 application in real life. But I would say yes, there is quite a lot in in the liberal uh, in a liberal thought that uh, should uh, uh, make us rather uh, cautious. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, John Locke or, or, or Thomas Hobbes, uh, you see that they start from uh, uh, from state of nature, of sort of some abstract situation. And uh, and then if you start from an abstract situation as a as a as a model to assess uh, real life, then uh, uh, social engineering is an obvious uh, uh, consequence. I mean, if you are a liberal, you must uh, do some form of so social engineering. You might do some form of social engineering, and if you if you do it. Uh, uh, in, a, in a moderate way, you, you may uh, escape the charge of uh, which I raised. But uh, 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 the, usually, the, the systems in the, the, the societies, both here in Europe and I think also in the states, uh, 
were society where they were they were not only liberal, right? There were conservative institutions, there were aristocratic institutions, there were all, all sorts of traditional institutions. So you do not really have the uh, the, the the state of nature, the clean state. But uh, as you know very well, the, in the early 1830s, uh, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, when he wrote his book about America, America, he also warned at the end of the book, watching American democracy in early 1830s, he warned uh, what he called the uh, despotism bienveillant et doux, despotism benevolent and mild. So uh, uh, yes, it's not just a perversion. Thank you. Um, so my first question is, uh, communism and, liber and liberalism are both secular ideologies, um, yet both began in Christian societies uh, and have been difficult to export to non-Christian societies. So why can't we conclude that Christianity is itself a secularizing force and one that, like liberalism, tends towards its own destruction? Why should, why should uh, Christianism be a secularizing force? Because uh, it uh, failed to resist the onslaught of uh, secular ideologies such as liberalism and uh, uh, and communism is is, is that uh, the, the the way you seem to argue? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, like Christianity uh, has been the kind of breeding ground for both communism and liberalism um, to sort of emerge, but at the same time, uh, Christian societies haven't. Um, non-Christian societies, excuse me, have not been receptive to liberalism and communism. Um, like for example, in Saudi Arabia, uh, communism and liberalism has not, uh, have, have, have not flourished. Um, so, you know, why can't we conclude that uh, Christianity might itself be secularizing if it's, you know, given so much ground to communism and liberalism? Uh... Well, Christianity has uh, s certain uh, uh, weaknesses. I mean, you can uh, you could see that uh, a lot of Christians were receptive to socialist or communist ideas in the belief that uh, uh, that socialism is a secular Christianism, right? That uh, that might be uh, they might meet. Uh, well, somebody is a is a socialist. Uh, he's secular, and uh, there's another person who is uh, who is a Christian, and they can work together because uh, they uh, they are interested in helping the poor, and uh, well, uh, imposing social reforms and so on. Uh, yes, but. Uh, 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 and probably there is also some tendency in Christianity to to look at liberalism uh, with a favorable uh, eye. But uh, but also you must remember that uh, Christianity and Christian religion, in particularly, uh, was an object of a, a very violent attack from the very beginning of modernity by uh, socialists and by uh, liberals. I mean, liberals wanted, uh, wanted Christianity to be diluted. Uh, if you read Locke or, or Hobbes or other, it was a very diluted form of uh, Christianity, whereas the socialists were simply, uh, with, with some exceptions, simply hated uh, Christianity. About Saudi Arabia, Arabia, I I don't know how to fit it into my argument because I know very little about Saudi Arabia. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, next question um, that we had is, uh, what if anything can we learn from ancient philosophy um, to shed light on this problem and perhaps attempt to solve it? 
Well, we can uh, uh, learn many things from ancient uh, uh, philosophy, uh, of course. Uh, uh, I think the, 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 weak, the weaknesses of, of democracy, I think, uh, the, the, the ancient philosophers were the first critics of the, uh, the democracy and they saw all these weaknesses, uh, like uh, Plato and, and Aristotle. Uh, and we also uh, uh, formulated arguments against the democracy or showing the weaknesses of, of democracy uh, in modernity, but these were the repetitions of the ancient arguments. But I think the, the, the crucial lesson that can be learned uh, from the ancients is that uh, uh, the democracy is not the best regime. Uh, well, we all know Churchill's uh, uh, phrase that uh, democracy is the worst regime, all others accepted. But, uh, mm, uh, uh, but if it means that uh, there, is, there are no better regimes than democracy, this is, a, this is the false statement. We know the, the answer, it is the answer that we know from the ancients, namely that the best regime is a mixed regime. Uh, there are certain areas uh, where uh, democracy is indispensable, uh, like uh, selecting the government, the transition of government, uh, elections and, and all that. But it doesn't mean that democracy, that everything should be democ democratized, that uh, families should be democratized, that the churches should be democratized. Uh, there are institutions which cannot, must not be democratized or liberalized. Um, and uh, and I think that's the, the basic answer that we uh, learn uh, from from the ancients. The, I think the the answer which was uh, remembered for quite a long time, even at the time of the foundation of the United States, you can read it in the writings of the of the of the founding fathers. Uh, similar ideas, which they 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 of course uh, took from the ancients, but then they were these answers were somehow forgotten. Thank you. Um, our next question uh, is, um, yeah, uh, so you stated in Poland that there is a diversity of opinion. Presumably this means that you see uh, less of the vices of liberal democracy there. Do you see a difference in the breadth uh, of opinions and acceptance of liberal democracy in former communist countries versus those in Western Europe? Well, what I see, what I see in Eastern Europe, in some countries of Eastern Europe, is that uh, uh, there is still this classical division between the left and, and, the, and the right. There are conservative parties and there are left-wing parties who are liberal or, or, or socialist. And, uh, uh, and this makes a difference. I mean, there is no mainstream politics. I mean, uh, the European Union and uh, the uh, lib liberal uh, uh, media and the, and the liberal opinion uh, want to make it, uh, turn it into the mainstream politics. But, but fortunately, it hasn't happened, and I think it, it won't happen. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the basis of this pluralism that I see uh, in Poland. I, I'm not saying that this is uh, uh, the essence of liberal democracy. It's the essence of every good political regime, every good political arrangement. That there is, uh, well, I we use this word diversity, right? That there is, uh, at least you have uh, a possibility to uh, vote uh, uh, left or to vote uh, right. And the, the conservative forces are strong and, uh, and, and, and that's good. Thank you, Professor. Um, we're gonna ask another question from the audience, uh, from an audience member. Um, 
uh, this one's a little more critical, so I hope it'll be interesting for you. Um, it says your party, your party in Poland contains some for many former communists, including the communist prosecutor Stanislaw um, Piotrowski. Your party in Poland is more. What's more, your party in Poland is most famous for distributing free money and free housing. Why are the similarities to communism in liberalism bad, but similarities to communism and illiberalism good? Well, I think the, the question, uh, I know this question, I think it might be from, must be from the same person that uh, uh, asked this question while I was at Yale. And it was, uh, and talk about my book, I had, I had the this, this same question about Stanislav Piotrowicz. Well, yes, there are some people in the Law and Justice Party who uh, were members of the, of the, uh, of the Communist Party uh, in the past. And uh, uh, with... Uh, I, I don't think, no name comes to my mind now of any former member of the party, of the party who might be accused of having committed uh, uh, something which uh, cannot be forgiven or uh, forgotten, uh, if you will. Mr. Stanislav Piotrowicz was a member of the Communist Party. Uh, he was a prosecutor and uh, 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 and uh, the only political case in which he was involved ended with the uh, uh, acquittal of the uh, accused person, which couldn't have happened without the initiative of the prosecutor. So, uh, uh, so let's forget about Stanislav Piotrowicz, you might find uh, uh, another uh, person, certainly not Stanislav Piotrowicz. I can't think of uh, uh, any, and we, uh, by the way, we, we do not uh, uh, give uh, free houses, there are no free houses. Um, okay, next question from the audience. Um, will Europe respond to increasing their financial support to uh, NATO or for NATO or think that Trump is not serious about asking for more participation from member countries? Uh, we, are, we are very serious about uh, NATO and we would like as much uh, involvement of NATO forces in, the East, in Eastern Europe as uh, possible. Eastern Europe probably is uh, now more from NATO than Western Europe. Uh, in Western Europe, there are strong anti-American sentiments and uh, NATO is somehow associated with uh, the United States and, uh, uh, and with the, the, uh, well, uh, and, and that's why there's a talk about uh, building uh, uh, a European army, which will not happen probably. So uh, we, uh, yeah, we are great supporters of NATO and we were very happy with uh, uh, the contacts between the Polish president and, and President Trump. Uh, we, we treated it very seriously. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Professor. This is another question from the audience. It says, thank you so much. My question is, uh, how should we perceive the rise of communist China combined with a very strong economic power in terms of its impact on the democratic regimes in the world at large? Is there anything we can learn from China? Uh, I don't know, I must say. Uh, China is a uh, uh, is a very uh, dangerous, dangerous country uh, because, well, everybody knows why it is dangerous. It's become strong eco economically and it's, it's very autocratic and, uh, and it might be a destabilizing uh, force. Uh, China is a, is a world apart. I mean, uh, it's, uh, uh, 
a communist that was there was Chinese version of communism. Uh, capitalism that is there, it's a Chinese version of, uh, uh, of uh, capitalism. And uh, well, I just, I just uh, don't know. I cannot imagine any form of plural system in China. I, I do not know much about China, but uh, on, the on the basis of the knowledge that I have, it's very unlikely that you will have either uh, 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 ideological or cultural diversity or you will have uh, a political uh, diversity. And uh, also there is uh, no feeling that uh, the country itself lacks stability. So there will be some kind of re revolution or, or, or change of the system. So, uh, so China, as we know it now, will, will be with us to stay, I think, for some time to come. Uh, our Thank next you. question uh, is, it seems like liberal democracies and communist regimes have very different conceptions of people and self-ownership. Liberal democracies believe at their cores that people own themselves and communist regimes believing in a collective communal ownership of individuals. Uh, how can you reconcile this major political difference and how these two different types of regimes view self-ownership of the individual with the supposed differences of which you speak? Uh, I, I'm not sure I, I understand what the sentence, the individuals own, own themselves can mean. Uh, we do not own ourselves entirely as in individuals. Uh, I think it's a misconception of liberal uh, philosophy, a fundamental misconception that uh, the liberals interpret uh, uh, human nature as uh, individual, self-contained individual. Uh, we are not self-contained individuals. We are social creatures. I, I profoundly agree with Aristotle, who uh, interpret human nature as he used the word political, but we would rather say social. Uh, that is, we uh, develop, we develop our nature, we flourish, we come or we may come to full humanity only uh, within community, right? within society. I will not develop my qualities on my own. It must be in interaction with other people, people in these communities. And that was a, a concept totally foreign to, to Marxism and to, to, to communism, particularly that we were owned by the, uh, the communist bureaucracy in the almost literal sense of the word. We were not Aristotelian. Uh, creatures that uh, wanted to develop their humanity through uh, uh, inculcating virtues right, and, and living in the community. So I think one of the, the weak weaknesses, the basic uh, defects of liberal theory is this deficient view of, of human nature which explains why in a liberal society people are so easily manipulated that there is this rise of uh, ideology that uh, uh, that there's ideological waves uh, uh, you know ideological crusades uh, if you are an aristotelian human being you will not you will not be easily uh, uh, manipulated. So, if you are if you are an individual, a self-contained individual, you are you are defenseless. You seek your uh, larger identity, and then you become a a, 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 a warrior of political correctness. Any 
thank you, Professor. Um, another question we had from the audience is, what impact do you think the mass media has had on the development of the new despotism and how is the internet and social media changing this? Uh, well, mass media had an enormous uh, effect uh, on this new despotism because uh, for a large number of people, uh, it's the only it's the only uh, sort of way of education. Uh, the language that we acquire, the phrases that we use, the associations that we have are mostly through the media. Uh, there are not many people left who read books and who uh, are educated on, uh, uh, I don't know, Shakespeare, right? Or, or Hawthorne or, or Plato, uh, uh, but uh, the, the, the language and the, the general framework that we have are, are through, the, through the media. Uh, and, and the media usually have this, this language through ideology, which is spread by, by, by politicians and uh, and, and also by the academia. Uh, now, the social media are important, of course. Uh, uh, if it uh, weren't for the social media, we would have uh, this, this new despotism would, would, be, would be complete. Uh, uh, they, they make a difference, but, uh, but, uh, but, but that's not enough. I mean, they make a difference in the sense that uh, uh, you can see that there is some, uh, some alternative. You can see that there is, uh, 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 there is another way of looking at things. Uh, but, uh, but you can also look at it, you can, you can also look at it as a closed uh, uh, enclave. Uh, uh, the, the social media of a certain tribe and uh, you disqualify this, this tribe. To give you an, an, an example, uh, there was a German uh, party called Alternative für Deutschland, but it was established in, uh, in Germany a couple of years ago. Uh, it, it, it was one issue party. It was against the, the euro currency, part, part the, the party organized by very well educated professors of economics. And uh, it, was, uh, it was vilified, it was viciously attacked disqualified. They had their own social media, but they were uh, attacked and vilified by all the major uh, newspapers, by, by television, uh, by, by, by the weekly, by Spiegel, Stern, Frankfurter Allgemeine, Süddeutsche. Deutsche. Uh, if all these great media uh, treat you as a fascist uh, or as a lunatic, the social media that you have, uh, it's good that they exist, but they won't help you. Thank you, Professor. Okay, um, our next question asks, would you agree that desirable change here and in Europe involves increasing the freedom for individuals and institutions to dissent from the liberal consensus? Uh, incre is increasing cultural uh, and opinion diversity and dissent uh, important in this mission? Well, it's extremely important. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, look, I mean, if, uh, liberal consensus. Now, uh, uh, if anybody knows the uh, history of philosophy, he knows that liberalism was not the, the main philosophical orientation and probably not the most, in, certainly the, not the most important orientation. So you cannot, you may be, you may, you may be, uh, you, you need not be a liberal, you may be a non-liberal, and still you may have something to say and quite uh, important things to say. Uh, so yes, uh, I, I believe that we need, uh, we need dissent, we, we need some kind of uh, diversity, we need, uh, 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 people uh, uh, 
In Europe, we, I think we need monarchies. There are no monarchies in the United States, I'm sure. Uh, uh, but we need Aristotelians, right? We need uh, uh, Platonists, uh, uh, we need uh, Catholics. And when I say Catholics, I mean real Catholics, not liberal Catholics, because they are more liberal than they are Catholics. I mean, you have to, uh, you have, to have uh, the choice of orientations that are full-fledged. I mean, it's not that they say, well, they, they cannot start the, the present, uh, presentation and their identification saying, I'm liberal something, because it, it reminds me of the communist practice of saying, Yes, I'm a, I'm a communist uh, Catholic, right? I'm a Catholic communist. No, if you are a Catholic, you are a Catholic. If you are a communist, you are a communist. So uh, th that's precisely what we lack in the, in the Western world. That every, everyone wants to be a part of the, uh, of the mainstream and it's become so stifling, really, intellectually as well as, as, as politically. And, and, and morally. Thank you, Professor. Um, in the recent past, there's been, um, past few years, there's been a lot of skepticism of what you called earlier in your lecture today, supranational institutions. Um, I'm thinking of uh, suspicion of the European Union and Brexit and mo more recently, um, skepticism of the WHO. Um, is this a is this backlash though not also a product of democratic principles or is it a backlash against liberal democracy as a whole? And sort of the second part of that question is, um, to what degree do you think the problems and the pathologies that you've identified today would be present if liberal democracy was deployed only on a much smaller scale within communities that had some degree of shared values rather than over large groups of people and even nations? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, you can raise all sorts of arguments uh, against the supranational institution. One of the arguments is that uh, uh, they are not democratic enough. I mean, we, if you have a political power structure and uh, and European Com Commission, for example, the European Commission is a power structure. Uh, you usually choose a democratic way, a democratic way of legitimizing this power structure. That is, they must be elected. It's not, it's not a monarch, right? It's not an uh, uh, ar aristocracy, like you have, you may have aristocracy of sorts in art, when they are great artists and they are not so great artists and mediocre artists. But in a political institution, you, there is mostly this democratic le legitimacy. And these institutions do not have this democratic uh, legitimacy. And that is, uh, 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 and that is a, a way of uh, uh, formulating your argument against them, that they are less and less uh, uh, accountable. But accountability is not only uh, is not only uh, uh, democratic. I mean, in every political system, whatever its structure, there must be some degree of account accountability. Otherwise, it's not it's not politics. Uh, and they are more and more unaccountable. So yes, you may use this democratic uh, uh, argument. Uh, they counter -argue, argue. I mean, those who defend those institutions. They say that they are the uh, logical continuation of the democratic structure, that we do not want to have to uh, limit democracy, political democracy to nation states. We want to extend this democracy uh, to uh, international level. Right, and that's why you have these institutions that are perhaps not fully democratic yet, but we will, in time, we will make them more and more uh, democratic. To which I answer, no. This is not a this is not a good uh, argument, because and that that uh, now I pass on to the next uh, part of your question or to the the second question. There is no. 
democratic, there is no European demos in Europe. And uh, you cannot make, you cannot create a democratic institution for the democrat, for the European society, because the European society does not exist. Uh, and yes, I believe that uh, a good political institution can uh, work only within a society in which there is some kind of, as you say, shared values, homogeneity. It might be very loose, right? It might be very difficult to identify Right, you have Switzerland, and they are four. They speak four languages, but still, they have some shared uh, uh, some something that unites them as Switzerland. Uh, and you you cannot, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't really use the political system to uh, to. Uh, I mean, you take everyone who comes, no matter what the background is, no matter what uh, culture, what religion, and then the, uh, this, the political structure will make those people uh, uh, loyal members of the, uh, of the new society. To my knowledge, the United States was the only country where this uh, uh, experiment was uh, uh, successful, but, but, uh, but, uh, but mostly because it was for many years, it was uh, uh, dominated or ruled by the Europeans. Uh, you had black community that were slaves. Uh, you had uh, 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 community from, from Asia who didn't take part in the uh, in the democratic process, and then when you started to democratize, you have a, you have a problem, uh, which is something that could be expected. You are doing a very good job, but uh, there are uh, quite influential uh, uh, analysts of American society who are very concerned about the, this this uh, disintegration of the uh, American uh, society. But in Europe, in Europe, it would be would have been even more difficult than it is in the United States. Um, so I think uh, I, I'll ask a question for our last uh, question to close out the session. But I'm wondering, what are kind of the what's the role of uh, more regionally aligned supranational initiatives like the Visegrad Group or the the Three Seas Initiative um, in kind of uh, restoring the European demos, which you mentioned. Uh, well, they are, they are, I think these initiatives are important because we, at least in Eastern part of Europe, we, we, we have to <clears throat> create some kind of political counterbalance to uh, Western Europe. So United, European Union is uh, dominated, in fact, is governed by a, a few big guys, right, from from from, from Western Europe, like, like Germany and uh, and France. Uh, I was talking about obscure power uh, system in the European Union, but a lot of decisions come from Berlin or from Paris rather than from. Uh, from Brussels, and politics is about equilibrium. If you do not want to be dominated, you have to create some kind of counterbalance. And what they that we, we have been doing is it's extremely uh, difficult. But it's more about cooperation than about uh, making uh, European demos or uh, making super a supranational institution more, more efficient. I, uh, I think that if, if the European Union is to survive, it should be a, a mechanism of cooperation. Uh, and, uh, and that's the direction in which uh, 
my country and, 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 and several East European countries uh, uh, are going. Whether we will succeed, I, I do not know. All right. Um, on behalf of the Buckley program and all of its fellows, thank you, Professor Legutko, for joining us um, this afternoon, or I guess evening for you. Um, we appreciate it, and thank you to the audience for all of their fantastic questions. So thank you, Professor. Thank, thank you. It's been my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care.